Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to another uh, Webinar Wednesday by Smart Karma. Uh, I'm your host, Michael Tegos. Uh, I'm excited to be joined today by David Huggins. David is a portfolio manager at the BJF Nutrition Fund at BlackRock, uh, focusing on nutrition and the future of food. David, great to have you with us. Thank you. Um, we will uh, just give it some time to let people kind of uh, stream in. Um, some uh, quick housekeeping before we get started. Uh, please feel free to send any questions using the Q&A tool uh, button on your Zoom app. Uh, please do not reshare or reproduce uh, the contents of this webinar without express permission. A recording of the webinar will be available, as always, on the registration page afterwards. So, of course, David, uh, our topic uh, today is uh, Beyond Food No Longer Impossible, which obviously mm -hmm. kind of points to the two most well-known plant-based uh, protein manufacturers, uh, and we can never resist a pun here at Smart Karma. Um, <laughs> but uh, as people kind of, uh, you know, settle in, uh, maybe you can give us like a brief introduction uh, to the BGF Nutrition Fund um, and kind of its focus uh, and angles of uh, investment and uh, especially sustainability. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Nutrition was launched just over a year ago. Um, as part of BlackRock's Sustainable Thematic Suite, and I've been named on it uh, since the start of this year. And the fund's mandate is to invest in anything related to um, food and beverage consumer trends. And our job is to, uh, one, make sure that the fund invests in those faster moving um, rivers within that overall thematic, but also uh, to abide by our sustainability mandate which is to ensure that at least 70% of the fund is investing in companies which align with the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. Um, so it's important um, and critical that the companies that we invest in broadly um, are helping the world move towards a more sustainable food chain. And of course, plant-based and um, some of the other topics that we're gonna talk about today are a really big piece to it because the food chain is possibly one of the single most polluting pieces of humankind. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it seems like um, a lot of the, the trends that are going to be shaping this market and, and its adjacent ones have been kind of developing for a while. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it seems like it's both, you know, uh, commercial as well as environmental. Right. Um, so, yeah. I guess could you could you sort of drill down on on some of those trends that are helping buoy those uh, you know the current plant based protein manufacturers uh, and alternative food manufacturers um, and kind of uh, are shaping how the market where the market is going to head next? Yeah, um, that's a great thing to dive into, um, and many of these companies. Uh, there are many predecessors to the to the famous ones which are um, getting all the headlines today. Um, and so right. you could sort of ask the question, why, why now? And um, are these products really that much better than the past? And I think it's probably, it's the, it's the fact that these products are significantly better than other meat alternatives that have been available before. So consumers actually can take um, a plant-based burger and almost think that it could be an animal-based. So there is a, a big piece to it. Uh, finally, these products are close enough to the, the, the ones that we're used to eating that the transition suddenly becomes a lot easier. But second, there are more and more consumers, particularly millennials and Gen Zs, who rethink really about the impact their daily lives have on the planet. And Eating meat, particularly beef, is massively um, carbon pollutive. Now, I'm, I'm not a vegan and I'm not a, um, uh, I am a flexitarian. And I think I'm probably the, the ideal person for this kind of product because I 
I like eating meat and I'm not going to preach to everyone that we should all be vegan tomorrow because I accept that people have habits and we have a culture of eating meat and it's not going to change overnight. And so I can't accept that everyone's going to eat veggie burgers tomorrow. But the, the wave is here and there are more and more people asking for these kinds of products and that's causing more and more companies to be able to raise more and more capital to invest in creating these great products and that's what's beginning to happen and you're getting this snowball effect and more and more people are beginning to appreciate the impact our eating habits have on the planet and there are such easy I things think you i think you have a um a kind of a very good point there in terms of mm. this used to be a very niche thing right uh, the this yeah. consideration of you know what we eat and what the impact it has uh is um and a lot more people seem to be caring about it right now so that kind of translates as well to to a, a far bigger market than was previously available yeah definitely um and I think the companies make a much bigger thing of the the sustainability driver behind it. But I actually think that if these products didn't taste good, they wouldn't be selling them. And True. that's the main taste has to work. And the sustainability movement is becoming becoming more and more relevant over time. Um, and it's an, an incredible voice piece for um, the movement away from animal protein. Um, um, can, do you see also a, a sort of um, the influence of uh, increased income in some parts of the world that, that sort of make, uh, hmm. make such solutions more available? Possibly, yes. I, I think you're seeing um, much of this movement is taking place in wealthier parts of the world like the US and Europe, uh, where people have the luxury of being able to pay a premium for a plant-based burger rather than the animal one. Um, and over time, you would hope that the cost, or it is expected that the cost of plant-based and the other technologies like lab-grown and uh, microbial fermentation proteins um, will achieve parity with animal. And it is getting there. And that will be the real trigger point because Still today, you have to pay a 20 to 30% premium for the uh, plant-based version, which is sort of nine out of 10 on terms of sort of replicated um, taste and nutrition. So there, there has to be that affordability angle and that's getting there. And that's why mm -hmm. you've probably not seen uh, these kinds of products take off in poorer parts around the world. So that's sort of the next step. But um, there, there is a future out there where you may see protein become truly, truly sort of commoditized by production of um, protein in huge vats from um, fermentation technologies, which are significantly lower cost than animal protein. Mm -hmm. And then you may actually see governments investing in these technologies and paying royalties to tech companies who have that technology. And those governments can help feed their nations with super efficient fermentation programs rather than using a cow and feeding it for three years with grass and getting protein at the end of it. It is a completely backward technology, if you like, um, mm -hmm. at what humankind has become really good at. We've become really good at getting a cow to be as efficient as possible at producing meat. But the cow, by definition, wasn't designed to perfectly produce only meat. They do a lot of other things too. Um, so there's a, an evolution of technology as well uh, that will sort of bring that cost down and will allow mass adoption, which we're not there yet. It's still relatively niche. Um, mm. I guess the final piece to it is that we, we perversely are seeing all these products get amazing airtime. And so people are trying them more than they possibly would um, because mcdonald's and burger king are getting on the bandwagon and uh, selling the beyond burger uh, what they call it the beyond um the blt the beyond lettuce and tomato that's what they call it uh, which is yet to right. be launched catchy <laughs> yeah if you can remember it 
I guess, yeah, I guess it's, it's the, it's the mind share challenge, right? Um, it's, it's one thing to be able to, to talk about these, uh, these technologies and these, um, these trends and on the commercial level, but when you come to the consumer level, that's kind of the, the bet that needs to, uh, to be made, right? Does mm -hmm. the, does the audience, do the consumers, um, engage with this? uh on 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 this level or is it just a fad that just goes away eventually you know yeah yeah exactly and that's been the debate for a while is, is this just a fad and um i guess that was possibly our debate when we were looking at one of these companies coming to ipo the very famous one mm -hmm. um we were trying to understand is this plant-based thing a fad or is this uh the start of something much much bigger and mm -hmm. I think the reality is, is that it is not a fad. It's, it's far too important to humankind uh, for it to not be. Um, mm -hmm. And um, these companies are also getting critical mass. So even if it was at risk of being considered a fad, these companies now have capital and they now have partners all around the world. So they're not going away anytime soon. I see. That's, uh, that's a good point. Um, so as this, as these trends are developing, um, we are, we have now come, you know, it's, it's 2020, so everything's up in the air. Um, the <laughs> COVID-19 crisis has sort of, um, really derailed a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, these, these trends. Um, so mm. as a disruptor, um, mm. rather, do you think that, that it's acted more as a disruptor or more as the catalyst for, for yeah. this industry? Um, it's a really good point. And I would say initially it was probably considered a, COVID was considered a negative. And I say that mm -hmm. for the short term, but probably not much impact in the long run, um, possibly temporarily. Well, well, we'll get to that in a moment, but in the short term, the, sure. in lots of puts and takes, so um, the major way for a consumer to try a plant-based um, product, whether it's a burger or whether it's a plant-based milk, so one of the very famous oat milk companies has had a, an extremely successful strategy of getting their products into independent coffee shops and getting that first moment for the consumer to try that in their coffee, ready to go in the best way it could be made, and then they think, I really like this stuff. I'm going to go and buy that when I'm in the retail store. And that's really powerful. And that's exactly what the burger companies have been doing as well. They've been getting into McDonald's and Burger King. And they've had massive, massive mindshare very quickly. But these are all things which shut down during COVID. And that was the major way for these companies to get mindshare and to get in people's faces and get it in people's stomachs. So that's been short-term negative. However, the offsetting fact, which um, is also really important and really intriguing how it's taken place, is that uh, COVID has caused massive disruptions through the traditional protein supply chain, particularly in the US. These facilities are labor intensive and people are working close together. And you unfortunately have had- So some like really the meat packers and the um, yeah. sort of, uh, the, the supply chain basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So. Where, where a cow goes in and meat comes out, basically. These facilities... <laughs> Great way to put it. <laughs> um, but these facilities rely on huge amounts of people. So the typical facility might have 2,000 people working in there. And they work in close quarters. And unfortunately, COVID has had really big impacts on those populations. And so you've had in the US times in, in um, March and April where... 40%, 50% of the entire pork or beef um, processing capacity was shut down because of COVID. And so meat prices skyrocketed. And I don't think you ever got to a spot where there was just no meat on the shelves, but prices mm -hmm. had to go up. And yep. amazingly and interestingly, when you saw those prices rise, you saw, um, and when you saw those prices rise above the plant-based alternatives, you saw a massive uptick in demand in those products. So kind of ties back to that question before about affordability. The moment it is at parity with meat or below, you're seeing a very, very rapid adoption, 
which is very important. So all, all that to say, COVID has had m major shocks and possibly um, you've seen some of a boon in retail, which has been good for them, but their sort of mindshare uh, channel in QSR, quick service retail um, restaurant, has been massively hit. But long run, I think the, the debate is still out there as to whether there's a long run impact to it. Um, and so we've got, we've, we've yet to really see because many of those um, disruptions have sort of righted themselves. And now it's about mm. whether those companies have been successful in ensuring they still have very good um, distribution channel coverage, which most of them broadly do, especially in retail, which is where things mm. are very safe. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, I think it remains to be seen whether, you know, there, there's a lot of talk about whether we go back to normal, right? And I think in this case, yeah. it's do we go back to to those um, uh, those processes, that, those labor intensive uh, processes that do require this amount of workforce, do require these specific um, structures, or do companies kind of try to secure themselves for the future in case something like that happens again, or if um, this is here to stay. Yeah, exactly. Um, I guess the one thing that the, the, the large plant-based protein companies, at least um, on the sort of processed meat side, um, because they've heavily relied on massive, successful, reliable, um, quick service restaurant chains, they're actually net winning in the restaurant arena today and all the independents mm. are really struggling. So they probably will be relatively well served because um, their particular restaurant sub-channel is winning and retail is still doing absolutely fine. Um, so most likely COVID will be no headwind for them. Um, that would be my conclusion mm -hmm. in the long run. Right. Um... Let me remind you all that uh, you can uh, send any questions you have through the Q&A button. Um, and uh, having taken care of that, uh, I know that uh, what you're really excited about is sort of the disruption that comes after this disruption, right? So yes. the, the future of um, alternative food production, um, give us a bit of a picture of what that looks like and what the... Um, uh, what the most exciting areas there are. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I find this completely fascinating and pretty mind-bending. I'm not a scientist, but I understand something of what kind of technologies are, are evolving and, and being commercialized. And uh, it's so key in understanding what the next 10 to 15 years look like for global nutrition companies, um, particularly in protein. And the implications are massive. So, as as you alluded to, um, I actually think that plant-based protein companies are the temporary fix. They're the disruptors which will be disrupted. Um, and I believe that there are these technologies coming in um, cultured meat and microbial fermentation, which are more precise and more efficient with their feedstock. Uh, and can produce a product much closer to the finished protein that we all understand and expect um, and to a better degree than plant-based may ever be able to. Mm -hmm. So you may even think about plant-based as sort of the temporary runner in a relay who is going to be handing the baton over to microbial fermentation, which I think in turn will hand it over to lab grown in the long run and maybe if we just sort of touch on both of those um sure. and maybe start on microbial fermentation first which is a a pretty big mouthful but essentially it's a technology which um i was going to say they might need to come up with a sexier name for it yeah is it <laughs> it's not the best name and i'm not mm. sure that would really sell a lot of products if that's the way you you named it on your brand <laughs> Um, but I'm sure, well, there are, there are actually uh, one or two companies out there that are using this technology already and they've got much sexier names. Um, I'm sure. But um, they essentially take a microorganism, 
and they genetically engineer that microorganism to transform a base source of energy, usually sugar, into the molecule they want, so a kind of mm -hmm. protein. And you can actually get extremely precise about this production method. And people have been using this production method for decades. You use it to produce insulin, for example. Um, it's just that the technology has really come along in being able to understand and manipulate that yeast or other kind of microorganism to produce exactly what you want. And if you can produce exactly what kind of protein you want, suddenly your world opens as to what kind of protein you could produce at scale. And your feedstock mm -hmm. is extremely cheap. Sugar is a very abundant commodity and much cheaper than pea protein or rice protein or, or any of these others that are in plant-based. So mm -hmm. that is super exciting and it has a number of applications, whether it could be a much, much closer to reality um, beef style mints or whether it's a dairy milk. Um, but it's still never going to get you to be able to produce a fully fledged animal muscle like a steak. Um, that is beyond its technology and it will never get there. But there is a massive part of the market where it could serve better than plant based. So that is there are companies out there which are commercializing products in the next five years. And that's mm -hmm. the scary part. Um, scary for the incumbents, right? Amazing for consumers and amazing for the planet because the resource intensity of these technologies is multiples less. And that's what is really exciting because the world, well, agriculture um, and particularly livestock contributes anywhere between 20 and 50% of the world's greenhouse gases. So it frankly doesn't matter if we take less holidays or try and um, <laughs> fly you know, less or consume less plastic. Exactly. It doesn't move the needle. What moves the needle is how we eat. So right. microbial fermentation is a really important piece to it. And that is coming and it's coming fast. And then the next piece, which I touched on is, is the lab grown story, which kind of seems quite fantastical and far too out there to ever get to reality. But um, and scary in its own right, I guess. Exactly. Are we, are we playing yeah. God? Things like that. Yeah. I, I think there's a, fairly long way away from being concerned about that because this technology is difficult for a start and growing a muscle is not quite the same as growing um, all the organs of an animal. So it's a different ball game, but nonetheless, um, these technologies are getting there and the path to getting to commercial scale actually looks quite achievable over the next decade for lab grown. And that's what really shocked me is that it's not that these companies need to understand how to develop the technology. They're probably 70, 80, 90% of the way there on that. It's about scaling up the supply chain, getting affordable growth factors. That's what actually will allow these companies to really get to scale. And that could happen in the next decade. And then suddenly when I'm looking, doing the day job and I'm looking at a traditional protein company, and I'm doing my 10 year DCF and I've got a terminal growth rate of 2%, I've got to really question that 2% because maybe these companies aren't going to be around and growing at 2% along with GDP. And that's the really interesting piece to it all. Yeah. Um, um, but having said that, do you see some of those incumbents uh, sort of moving into those spaces if they see the potential um, and could they do that or are they looking at a, dis a disruption no matter what? Yeah. Um, what's interesting is that there are some companies out there, the incumbent protein companies that have a venture arm, which are investing in some of these technologies, which is really encouraging. Mm -hmm. However, when you speak to the management teams of these companies, they either dismiss the, the risk or believe it's so far out that it's not worth worrying about. And those two assumptions are extremely dangerous because before you know it, you're gonna have some very well-funded venture capital um, businesses eating your lunch. And frankly, that's kind of, excuse the pun, I didn't mean to do that. Um, um, that's kind it's, of what's- It's so well-placed that uh, you don't have to apologize. In fact, I'm gonna <laughs> congratulate you. <laughs> Natural talent in the pun arena. Um, 
anyway, uh, the, the incumbent protein companies, it's, if you're a $20 billion sales company, if you think it's enough to have a $50 million venture fund and you pop a few million and into a few startups, you th if you think that's enough to sort of secure your future, you're not thinking hard enough about the problem. Mm -hmm. And these companies are different. These, a traditional protein company knows how to take an animal and turn it into meat extremely efficiently. But what if there isn't an animal, right? Suddenly it's a different business model. What if you need to have a tech focused mindset? What if it's about optimization of bioreactors, not about how many people you have in your processing facility? It's a different mindset. And I think that's where this massive opportunity arises is that you're getting these new companies with new technologies which are coming in and they're fighting against people with it's, it would be like a battle between those with swords and shields and an invader with guns it's a, just a different sort of comparison and that's what i think has happened and the incumbents aren't doing enough right now to really secure a future that's my thinking. I'm sure they'd all disagree. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, maybe we'll even ask them at some point. Um, in the meantime, um, I have a, a question here, um, and it kind of ties in nicely to what you just said. Um, so these, these are the opportunities that you just described, but um, what are some of the risks that an investor would uh would be looking at if if they were looking at the space uh, because like you said a lot of those technologies are some some of them at least are uh a bit too far out um others yeah. might face um other challenges so uh, what would you sort of identify as a risk there yeah um really good point and it's it's obviously easy to pontificate about it here on a webinar but the reality sure. is is a startup launching a technology into a mature market, it's not a piece of cake, obviously. Mm -hmm. I completely appreciate that. And these big companies, they have some degree of moat, but I just don't think they're insurmountable. So the risks to these new companies coming into the space are, even if you trust that they have the technology um, nailed, for example, um, there is another challenge, like, can they commercialize it? Are they savvy commercial individuals or are they just scientists? And, mm -hmm. and you can have the most incredible technology, but if you don't have a commercial angle and a clear strategy to get your product into the hands of consumers, then they'll fail. So that's a really important point, but you are seeing, and it's what I would look out for, is these companies are wise to that. And a number of them are looking to find investors in their business who aren't just bringing capital, they're bringing strategic pull. So they might be a traditional meat um, distributor or obviously maybe a traditional meat company. And so you are beginning to see more of that. Um, and interestingly, you actually saw that or are seeing that in the vertical farming space. And it's a bit of a segue, mm -hmm. but um, that technology has been around for 20 years and it's been really expensive. And it's only in the last few years where the technology's started to get better but the real needle moving event has been those vertical farming companies have been signing up with retailers and putting these massive facilities next to the retailers warehouses and suddenly you avoid a supply chain issue and you get investment from a retailer and you get demand at 100 percent and your capacity utilization gets to 95 from day one and that's what these technology companies in the um protein space are beginning to do and I, I would look for that in their strategy but it, it's by no means a, a slam dunk on any of these companies right and, and like you said it, it is going to be a while before we we have a clearer picture uh i guess um and it will bear watching uh how the current uh, disruptors rather than the future disruptors uh fare in the market mm. Mm. Yeah, and that's fair. Um, now, we, we at BlackRock don't have the pleasure, or, or maybe it's um, a different word for it, I don't know, but we, we don't have the pleasure of being able to invest in some of these young companies. Our universe is mostly public. And so mm -hmm. what we can invest in are 
the incumbents, some of the plant-based guys, and that's fine. But we thought it was really important for us to understand what, what the next 10 years looks like so that I can put into my number on, put into my model for my incumbent meat company, what, what really it looks like in the long run. And do I actually really own this at all? Um, and also, if you have the insight around what these new technologies could mean, it also makes you question all the excitement around basic plant-based companies. Are they really the long run solution? Maybe they're a part of it, but I would question um, some of the valuations on some of them. Mm. It assumes too much. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, and I think this is, uh, this is a nice uh, point where we can uh, maybe put a period on, uh, on this discussion and kind of, um, you know, pledge to revisit uh, further developments uh, in future discussions. Yeah, no problem. Thank you very much, David, for sharing uh, all this very interesting uh, information. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being with us and taking the time. Um, as I mentioned at the top, uh, please do not reshare or reproduce any part of this webinar without uh, express permission. Um, and uh, do keep an eye out for the recording of the webinar uh, on the registration page. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, hope to see you at our upcoming webinars. Um, take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for dropping, guys. Cheers.